Howdy, folks. Uh, Jacob and I are both excited to be here and walk you through uh, ShareFile admin and billing expert settings. Uh, so we will run through a couple of the newer changes to the ShareFile admin experience, as well as some of the key settings that you'll want to have a nicely polished and professional ShareFile deployment. So with that being said, let's go ahead and dive in. And for starters, oops, one of the things we want to take a look at is something that you will see coming to a ShareFile account near you soon, uh, which is our new single sign-on and authentication flow. This will be a bit more of a footnote because it's not available on all accounts just yet, but it is the direction that we're headed and it is um, applied to some of our newer accounts already and uh, generally available. So let's take a quick look at what this looks like. Now, many of you may be used to the classic share file login screen, which if you do not have single sign-on enabled, you would be, simply be seeing a sign-in prompt, an email and password login box in the center of your screen with your company branding, including any logo and background. And if your company uses Active Directory or single sign-on, any other identity provider to credentialize to share file, then you likely have a split login screen as we see here with um, employee sign-in routing to whatever, in this case, Okta on one side of the screen. So all of that is still gonna be here moving forward, but it is gonna look a little bit different. So we'll take just a second here to show you how and why so that when it hits, you're already familiar with it. You'll still have your company branding. The logo will be up top. Your background image will be featured in a main pane on the page. And rather than have uh, a choice of where to put in my email and my password, which we've seen for the most part, sure, it works just fine, but there are scenarios when we're using ShareFile to communicate with especially external parties where that may cause a little confusion. So we've opted to simplify that and just say, hey, you're here, put in your email address. That's all. We're not asking you whether you know whether you should sign in as an employee or a client or anything else, especially when there's terminology where you may use that for what you refer to as vendors or partners or any other industry specific terminology. No, just, hey, put in your email. And if your email maps to a user that's required to use single sign-on, then you'll be routed directly to single sign. If, for example, you're a client user in ShareFile, you'll just be prompted for your password and you get to just keep on moving. So again, um, a little bit of a visual change. Functionally, it's not too different, but it is designed to cut down on any friction or potential confusion for not only your employees, but also your external parties that you communicate with. Uh, so I hope that helps. Uh, and with that being said, we will take a look through some of the admin settings, right? And I've got a couple of different share file accounts here. So I'm going to use Acme Corporation just to show off. Uh, so we've got that nice bright red branding at the top here. First and foremost, as a share file admin, you've got your controls on the left-hand side. And we're going to spend most of this webinar focused in the settings admin section. Now, every user has their own personal settings. For example, how often do I get email notifications and things like that? That is up to the individual, ultimately. They can come and reset their password if needed, and so on and so forth. So we're going to focus on the admin settings, which require me to have elevated permission, where I can manipulate these settings on behalf of my organization and impose certain policies and restrictions across my organization to make sure that everything is up to snuff corporation-wide. So uh, first and foremost, when we click into admin settings, we've got the admin overview page and we're able to see storage usage, bandwidth usage, and how many license we have consumed versus available. 
most of the time, the main admin is also the account owner, but for larger share file deployments, you may have a team of admins. Uh, and so I would of course see whoever the account owner is, if it's not me. If it is me, just a brief little call out, let's say I'm going on leave or going to be pursuing other projects, what have you, uh, I can actually reassign ownership of the share file account right here to another administrator and relieve myself of account owner duties. So that is available here as something for self-service. Now that we've got the overview page out of the way, let's jump down to company account info. So there are a couple of key components here. We'll briefly look at company branding and we'll spend a little more time on reporting because that is a very, very important component. So when we look through company branding, and I will also mention that on our YouTube channel, on our ShareFile YouTube channel, you can find past webinars that we've done that dive deeper specifically into branding. That's one of the reasons we're not going to spend a ton of time on this here today. But um, I do encourage you to check out our past recorded webinars there, as well as visit our website to sign up for any future webinars. Uh, but again, call out for the branding webinar. That was a good, good one. You can come into branding, label the account name as necessary, and account appearance. There are basic and advanced options. So you're able to drill down and tweak the background image on your main login page, uh, how your email notifications come across, and so on and so forth. Set the colors with hex codes, change your logo, any page title that'll show up in your browsers, title bar, et cetera. And you can also specify different subdomains. This is something that's often overlooked among our customer base. Um, sometimes we get customers who are merging with another company and they ask about how to get additional URLs. Uh, so we just wanna point out that you're able to have up to three, you could think of these as vanity URLs or alternate aliases. Um, that will point to the same share file tenant. So if I open up a new browser window and I go to acmecorporation.sharefile.com or acmedevelopers.sharefile.com or whatever I prefer, .sharefile.com, as long as someone's not already using this, I can save it to my account. And these, any of these in the URL bar will point me directly to the account you see now. They all go to one place. So they're just additional shortcuts or aliases. Now into the more um, scaled up visibility, monitoring, and insight that's available through our reporting tool. So there are two main methods of using reports in share file. Uh, one is to run them ad hoc, one at a time, and the other is to create recurring reports, which you can have generated periodically and de even deposited in a specific folder for your IT team to review. And so what does that mean? Let's, let's take a peek, and that'll shine a better light on why we would do some one by one versus setting up recurring. So uh, when we click create a report, we do have a hot link to view some examples if we want a little more color on this. Uh, but we have several different types. We have usage, which is general account activity and can be drilled down uh, into a specific folder or to trace activity of a given user. Or we can just look at that account wide. We have access reports, which I strongly recommend if you're in any regulated industry um, that you set one of these up to run periodically, maybe once a quarter, or I know frequently when I've dealt with some of our customers that are subject to HIPAA regulations, for example, uh, that these need to be produced at least once a year. Uh, but this will give you essentially a summary of who has which rights into which folders on your account. And you're able to file that away with your compliance department, keep that on file somewhere safe, 
uh, in the event of an audit or anything like that, it's nice to know where it is, where, how you can produce it, and maybe even set it up to just have it at the ready. Uh, access changes in kind review anything that differentiates from the previous access report. So let's say you ran an access report last month, but you want to see if anything has moved since that last time. You can specify an access change report for a given period of time. And further on, some of these, to be perfectly honest with you, may be a little less frequently leveraged, but we do have a storage detail so that you can get the line and letter of what actually lives in your share file account, a storage summary, which will tell you who's using how much and where, which folders are heaviest, a share report, which will tell you what kind of files are being shared out and by whom and to whom, and even requests, which is just the inverse, what's coming in and from where and who's asking for it. Details about your users, details about your bandwidth consumption, as well as an overall summary, and messaging going out from your account as well using our encrypted email feature. So just peeking a little bit further into one of these so that we can get an example. We're looking at that user report. This is probably my favorite. I'm glad it's at the top of the list. Uh, this is very similar to what you can pull on a given folder from the activity log. The difference here being this is a report you're curating. You can dial into any folder. And again, you can set this up to be generated on a recurring basis. Uh, but in terms of what it examines, it is very much the same as the activity log. We can look at any combination of logins, file moves, deletes and restorations, check-ins and checkouts, downloads, DLP scans, what's been rejected or marked okay, what's been shared out that's subject to DLP policies, if your account is set up for that, um, and any number of things here. So again, we can specify this based on a given user. If we want to track the behavior of a specific user or just look at a given folder as well. And we can choose whether or not to include the subfolders. We also have the option to generate this report in an Excel or comma separated value format. As you might expect, that's pretty much standard. So let's just keep on rolling. In this instance, I specified to set this up as a recurring report. So we have the option to run this daily, weekly, or monthly and specify a given day of the month. I mentioned briefly earlier that we can actually pick a location for this report to save. And because it's share file, sure, we have the option to actually have that folder notify, let's say our entire IT team so maybe I haven't even given those individuals the rights to run their own reports, but I can still have this report deposited in a place where I know who can look at it. Maybe I've even set them up to be notified when it's available. So I can still get that visibility, even if I don't want to allow maybe my whole team investigative permissions on my account. That's kind of nice. So since this is a mock, I'm just going to... Uh, leave this here. We can take a quick peek at one of these just briefly. So we can see here, this was our usage report. This is a standard usage report. Let's go ahead and auto fit the column width so we can see this a little better. So here we go. We've got date, time, what's going on, what What's been touched? Looks like we got a sample contract signed by Bert Macklin. And we even see the locations and event IDs. So that's an example of what you can get from some of our reports. That'll conclude our section on account reporting. And feel free to ask any additional questions in the chat. Again, quick reminder, we will reserve some time to review anything we haven't covered live based on Q&A. And so moving it right along, reporting is an important part of security, but we also have a security tab, which deals with things that are specific 
clear security. So let's look through some of these. We did see on our usage report that we could report on specific events revolving around data loss prevention, right? Now, this is a more advanced account setting, and it does require some additional pieces on your end. Um, data loss prevention is something that ShareFile integrates with. Uh, for on-premises ShareFile storage, we integrate with third-party DLP systems that use the ICAP protocol to scan and index your storage and return flags to ShareFile as to whether documents have been unscanned, scanned and deemed non-sensitive or otherwise okay, or scanned and determined to be sensitive or rejected in terms of being safe to share. So essentially, ShareFile is looking for these three flags, and based on these classifications, you're able to determine what happens with those types of files, who can download, and who can share them. So I can actually specify, for example, that unscanned documents are only downloadable and shareable by employees. Or maybe I want to restrict those even further because I don't know what category they fall into. And so I remove that share permission and only employees can only download these files. No one else can touch them based on the configuration you see here. I do want to add one piece of clarity too because on-premises storage is becoming more and more rare as time goes on. Uh, and so I did mention that DLP integrates uh, primarily with on-premises share file storage and third-party engines that communicate over the ICAP protocol. There are a number of cloud vendors that have built their applications to interface with ShareFile's cloud storage via our security API as well. We make the API available and it is up to the vendor to determine whether they want to build this piece to integrate. Uh, there are several. They generally don't fall into the traditional definition of DLP engines or providers. In the cloud world, we tend to see them as what are known as cloud access security brokers or CASBs, C-A-S-Bs, with DLP policies to scan and index and return flags based on data and data classifications. So that's certainly an item for follow-up. If you have some concerns or questions about that, I encourage you to reach out to your customer success engineer and get some further detail or clarification. And of course, in the meantime, feel free to use the Q&A feature and leave those questions right here in the chat. So moving along, what else does an admin need to do for security on a ShareFile account? Well, of course, security starts first and foremost with your password. So when we're talking about share file credentials themselves, so this has nothing to do with my single sign-on, that's all managed through my identity provider. Maybe that's Microsoft Entra, formerly known as Azure AD or O365 login. Maybe we're talking about Okta or Duo or one of the other identity providers that's out there in the world. But right here, we're referring to share files user identity, and native password requirements. Your minimum password length and the complexity, how many numbers, special characters uh, that are required, how many days before it expires, and password history requirements as well. So if you want to set up one of those rules that you can't use any of your last 10 passwords that expire every 90 days, so we're covering several years of password history, great. This is where you do it. This is how you would configure that. And as always, when you're in your admin settings with ShareFile, I should have called this out earlier, but don't forget the blue save button. That blue save button is your friend. In keeping with password requirements, and I can sense a question coming if it's not already in the chat, maybe I just don't see it, but Bruno, you mentioned that this isn't for single sign-on. So what about the, my user base that is using single sign-on? How do I make sure that they're not using share file, name and password, if I've got them set up for single sign-on? That is an option. 
under login and security policy. And we'll actually skip ahead to address that. You see your single sign-on configuration and whether or not it's enabled at all. This is where you put in your certificate, your IDP settings, et cetera. And if you want to force employees that have an SSO set of credentials to be required to use it when they log into ShareFile, here's where you would do that. I will call out that there are certain admin permissions that will exempt an employee from being required to enter SSO. And this is useful. Think about it. In the event that your certificate expires or something on your identity provider and identity issuers and changes, you do still need someone within the organization to be able to log into ShareFile and actually change and update those settings if, heaven forbid, those settings were to break. So employees with the Manage SSO permission and a selected set of other additional permissions around managing other employees and passwords, et cetera, will, will be able to log in in a break glass in case of emergency type scenario. So now that we've uh, covered password requirements without SSO and where to find SSO and SSO requirement settings, let's walk back through the rest of our login and security settings. Um, I strongly encourage everyone to have two-step verification enabled. Um, now this is, again, separate from your identity provider, but your client users are not gonna be using your identity provider, except for in some rare scenarios. So in the event that you do, like many of our clients, have external parties to your company who are, have been shared files and are logging in into a share file to access those, even if it's just a one-off share, sign in with your name and password to get this one file I'm sending you. In any event, I strongly recommend that you require share files native two-step verification for those users that are not using your SSO. And if you have an organization that's not using SSO for share file anyway, then I would suggest you turn that on for employees as well. This is built into ShareFile, doesn't require any additional components, plan changes, or pieces, and it will simply offer your users the option to receive a code sent to their phone via text or provided via a voice call or use one of those authenticator apps that rotates through a tumbler of codes like Microsoft Authenticator, Google Authenticator, Duo Authenticator, etc., cetera, uh, to act as that second factor of verification so that we know it is in fact them before we let them into any data. This is required unless you opt out of it. A couple of other settings you can specify when your users are locked out and for how long if they fail login attempts. Some of our customers, particularly in regulated industries, require custom terms and conditions upon login. You can specify that upon logging into the share file, your users be greeted with a splash screen that displays your own custom legalese. If this is something that you need, please contact ShareFile support department and or your customer success engineer for guidance and assistance. Now that these are out of the way, let's move on to something that's one of our newer goodies, security alert settings. You may have seen email communications about this in the past several months. So ShareFile now has the ability to alert you and a specified list of admins or alternate contacts when suspicious activity occurs. This is an area of a lot of focus for us internally. It's something that we feel greatly strengthens the security of our product and has been requested by our customers. And so we are happy to show you that this is the current state today and has been for several months and to let you know that this is an area of focus moving forward as well. So there may be even more goodies and expanded functionality coming to this page in the future. For today, we are able to send security alerts about potentially malicious activity and you're able to dial in exactly what you want. 
So for example, when a user signs in from a different country, you can send notifications about this activity to admins and optionally the employees themselves and optionally the clients themselves. Or users switching to a different city while also using a different device. Maybe they're not in a different country, but they've gone from New York to LA and they're normally on an iPad and suddenly they're on a Windows device uh, or multiple failed sign-in attempts or a suspicious file, something that is uh, potentially malicious, possibly quarantined by our antivirus, which is built in. Um, so these are our basic security alerts and whom would be receiving them. And so we're talking about account admins, folder admins, and then the users themselves. And we also have the option to specify alternate contacts. So this is where we can specify a distribution group of, for example, our IT team. Specific users and so on and so forth. As always, that blue save button is your friend. Don't forget to save. Walking through a couple of other ones here in the event that you did have one of those suspicious files uploaded and it was flagged by antivirus and quarantined. This is where you'd be able to find it. And we can also edit the super user group here. One thing that I want to call out with regard to the super user group and that last page about security alert settings, when we were looking into alternate contacts that might receive notification uh, of suspicious activity is the fact that super users and admins are not necessarily the same thing. Uh, ShareFile has a granular set of permissions, which means outside of the account owner who has the full keys to the kingdom, there is no predetermined quote unquote admin role. You're able to choose individual by individual what they can do and what level of control they would have over the account or over potentially any other users in the account. One handy shortcut to that is the super user group. Individuals added as super users will by default get access to all the files on the account, period. It doesn't mean that they can view your bill. It doesn't mean they can change your plan or swap out the logo on your share file account. But it does mean that anytime a new folder is set up, whether it's for an individual determined to be shared, etc., a super user group member will be able to see it. So this is a visibility and um, data governance measure. Moving right along, let's take a look into our advanced preferences. So first and foremost, we have our email settings. This one has somewhat been buried, at least in my own personal discussions for a while. Um, you are able to specify on your account that emails get sent from either share file itself, your basic no reply, or from the user sending the message. Generally speaking, we recommend that the email send from share file so that it's, it's clear that it's a, a notification from a system. But with just the flip of a switch, you can have these emails labeled as coming from the individual user, and hopefully that will help with deliver deliverability, excuse me. <laughs> and the user's email address will be used. Another hidden benefit there is if the recipient replies to the notification or message, it will actually be used and sent to the user's email address that generated their notification. Um, we can even take this one step further and use your own mail servers so that if there is any concern over whitelisting or overly aggressive spam filters, uh, if your recipients are set up to receive emails from your organization, 
maybe we need these notifications to go out internally, or we already know we're whitelisted with our receiving organization that's an external party, adding our own mail servers so that these messages are generated and routed through your own internal servers can be beneficial. Uh, this is certainly an advanced step, so I would encourage you to review the documentation if this is something that's interesting to you uh, and reach out to your CSE and tech support for help, but just want to make sure you know it's available. A couple of other key settings. Do we want users to have a log of their own activity that gets notified to them? Uh, most frequently this is off, but there are some scenarios where you may want to turn it on. Um, do you want folks that are uploading files to receive a receipt? Yes or no. And would you like to set a default notification frequency for all users on your account? Now, this is a global default. If I'm your user, especially if I'm your client, an external party that does business with you, I still have the right to log into ShareFile and say, I'm getting too many emails. Let's dial this back to once an hour twice a day, once a day, etc. However, you as the admin can come in and specify a default for your users so that they don't necessarily have to get emails in real time that one by one files are being added to a folder. That's particularly helpful if your organization tends to move files into folders in batches. However, if you reserve your external facing folders for <clears throat> someone that's only occasionally going to be receiving files, then you may actually want real time so that people can act on this intelligence more quickly. And of course, the encrypted email, uh, something for our premium customers, is actually secure encrypted messaging built into ShareFile. You can decide whether to turn that on or off. And that's going to deal with your inbox here, as well as our plugin share file for Outlook, which can encrypt the message body and not just the attachments, uh, even directly in your Outlook. So again, when you share out attachments or files with share file, whether it's in a folder or transferring a link to another individual, those are secured and encrypted by default. However, uh, the encrypted email is referring to the actual message content itself and you have the option to disable or enable that across your account. Keeping an eye on time, we're going to walk through a couple of other options here a bit more quickly, right? But we do want to know about permissions. For instance, when we've got clients added on a folder, do we want to allow them the capacity to share out files? We've given them the files, so obviously they could download a copy and do whatever with it if we've allowed them to do that. So do we want to allow them to use ShareFile to share it out to, let's say, another partner within their organization, what have you? That's fully up to you. As well as when your users are browsing a folder and they're not an administrator of your ShareFile account, do they get to see who else can see that? Do they get to see the access list or the roster? Yes or no. So for privacy's sake, you can easily turn that off. But... If it fits your usage, you can turn that back on, no problem. Another area where we've got some newer goodies and, and have put some focus in in the past several months uh, is our file settings tab. We actually have now global default share and request settings. And so we'll explain this in more detail, but so that we're not redoubling our efforts here, I'll just mention that these settings are essentially the same, whether you're sharing out files or requesting files to be incoming, right? So we won't go into any further clarification there, except to point out that they each have their own unique save button so that they can be saved independently of one another. But when we generate a request to, or, or rather a link to share a file, I'm the admin. I want to set things up so that everyone in my organization is doing this appropriately. So what will I allow? Will I allow a link that requires just possession of the link to get to the file? Or do I want to force everyone in my organization to only generate links that require the input of a name and email address? 
before any access is afforded? Do I want to restrict this to only registered users of ShareFile, be they client or employee, so long as they are credentialized and given specific access? Or do I want to only use ShareFile for employees, period, when I'm sharing out files and generating links? And that doesn't mean that I wouldn't have flexibility to add a client to a folder. So we're talking about ad hoc sharing of a link here. I'm able to mix and match any set of defaults that I want. And again, these are global and apply to the generation of links, share links, and in kind request links. Default settings, we're referring to uh, what would be selected by default. So here we're able to turn these on or off completely as a permission, whereas further down, we're able to specify what's the default from the available permissions. And we're able to specify that anything we do through our Outlook plugin be a slightly different default than our web application, if applicable for you. Along with that, again, we're talking about generating links and not adding people to folders. So we are able to specify maximum expiration period, one day, anywhere up to a year or indefinitely. One other brand new hot off the presses this piece is our secure share recommender, where ShareFile using AI is able to look at the file and determine whether this seems like it's something that would be sensitive and whether we want to red flag that for you and tell you, hey, before you send this out, do you want to put a password on this? Do you want to require that your users who are receiving this must log in because it looks like it might be sensitive? And of course, you can learn more about that through the knowledge base article here, or turn it off if you prefer. A couple of other key elements before we move on completely. Uh, we are able to specify the number of versions of files that are kept. So we can house all prior versions of a file that's been overwritten with the same name, or limit that to only a certain number of versions. And we're also able to specify a global default retention policy. So when files are deposited into a folder, how long do they stay there before they're just automatically purged from the system? Again, this is something that's very relevant in uh, re regulated industries. So hope that's helpful for you. If you're sharing out view only content, there are some scenarios where you may have a watermark. So I wanna point out for admins, this is where you would configure what that watermark looks like. And these are dynamic. So these will source the viewer's email address and potentially first name, last name, IP address, date and time. So when we're sharing a file with view only permissions, they can only see it in their web browser. And we have the option to superimpose a watermark there on top of it so that you know that no one would feel comfortable screenshotting, printing, or even busting out their phone and snapping a photo of the screen in front of them in order to potentially leak your sensitive data. Uh, hopefully this will help you sleep a little bit better at night. Two more final points as we wrap up here. M Microsoft Office co-editing. Office documents can be edited in ShareFile live in real time with other users in a collaborative environment. Because this stages the files in Microsoft Office, and writes the saves back to the share file immediately and in real time. Uh, we do want you to be aware that it's being routed to your Microsoft account for that editing. Um, so please be aware of that. And based on your compliance requirements, you determine whether or not you want to turn that on or off. If you are using on-premises storage for your share file account, there are certain scenarios like the Microsoft Office editing which would require you to either host your own local Office Online server or agree to allow these files to be previewed and rendered in the cloud. That is subject to your own security and compliance and regulatory requirements. Uh, so please know that that is an option that you have. We are built from the ground up to uphold your compliance. So we put this power in your hands. If you have some concerns and questions, Again, this is definitely a topic to reach out to your customer success team for further clarification or 
Browse our archive of webinars and our knowledge base. That being said, our final segment here is going to be a brief look at our storage zones dashboard uh, before we hand it off to our senior product manager, Jacob. So our storage zones section consists of the different locations and repositories where you can host data and share file. If you're housing on-premises servers that hold your share file data, they would be considered customer managed storage zones. If you're not familiar with what that means, there's a considerable amount of admin overhead uh, compared to log in, set it and forget it using share files, in-house managed cloud storage, which is just there, but there may be certain applications where that's necessary for you to do so. If so, this is where you would find that and you'd be able to check the heartbeat and storage consumption of your various zones here on this screen. In kind, you can also check your various share file managed cloud zones and their respective usage. I want to point out that if you are fully cloud and even if you're not into managing and building servers and dealing with customer managed data, if you have a need for geographic dispersion of your data, whether it's for compliance with, for example, EU regulations or Canadian data privacy regulations, or simply for performance considerations like, hey, I want my team in Asia to be closer to the files in Asia because they're big and I don't want to send the data all the way around the world and slow the system down. No problem. Call our support department or contact your customer success team. Upon request, we can enable different geographic zones for you, which you can turn on and off at will. These are not there by default. By default, everything is housed in ShareFile US East, but upon your request, we will surface additional geos in your storage zones panel. You can see the consumption, you can turn them on and off, and once those are in place, you're actually able to default specific users and or specific folders to always reside in a given zone for your convenience and compliance. That being said, I think that's the point that Jacob wanted to tag in and talk a little bit more about our storage consumption and our dashboard. So Jacob, I will pass it to you, sir. Thank you very much, Bruno, uh, for passing it over. And thank you for the deep and thorough a walkthrough of all the admin security and other settings. This was very, very deep. Thank you for that. Um, so I'm going to take over and share my screen real quick here. And um, before I do that, I'll just say that my name is Jacob Ingram and I am one of the senior product managers here on the team and um, covering our billing experience as well as other areas in the product. And today, I would like to go over some of the recent changes and, and updates we did to our billing experience and um, in product for all of you to leverage. And um, and before I dive deeper, just I will just say that um, if you have any uh, suggestion or ideas how to improve the billing experience, you can always reach out to me. Obviously, if you have an account specific issue, please reach out to our support team and our customer success engineers. But if you have any suggestions for product improvements, that's where I come into play and happy to have a call and hear a use case, understand your use case and consider that to be added to our product. And uh, with that being said, I'm going to jump straight into the billing section, which is under admin. And um, I'm going to go over and the billing section and what happened in the past that not all of our customers had access to this billing section in the product and we did a lot of work behind the scenes to enable a lot more customers to have self-service and have a lot more functionality in self-service and it was the goal to empower and enable all of you to be able to self-service your account from billing perspective without the need to call us as much as possible. And uh, so I'm going to go through a couple of sections here. I'll start with the receipts and billing notifications. And, and I also mentioned that uh, there are some accounts that may not see exactly this view and that's fine because we are still um, 
throwing out the functionality. So if you don't see exactly this view, all that, you will get it soon. Okay, so on the billing section, the first section is the receipt and billing notification. And this is where, if you are paying by invoice, this is where all your invoices will come. I don't have any invoices right now, but if I were on an invoice and billing, then I will get the invoice here and you can see uh, the date of the invoice. You can see the status, if it's paid or not paid. And if it's not paid, you can actually come here and click on paying and you can actually pay the invoice right from here. You don't need to send a check. You don't need to um, call us. You can just pay your invoice right from here. You can all also send a check, not a problem. But if you would like to do it from the product, you can do it from this section. And the next one is the billing info uh, tab. And this is where you can go and again, self-service update all your billing information. You can update your address and as well as your credit card. If you are on credit card billing, this is where you can go and add your credit card and you can update the credit card if it's expired or changed. You can come here and just update the credit card so it will be up to date in our system and for automatic billing. The most important tab here is actually the managed plan. So this is where you can do the bulk of actions from self-service and we completely redesigned this to make it uh, very easy for you all to use. So this page will look a little bit different depending on which plan you are. And I'm currently on the advanced plan. So if I would like to upgrade, I can go and upgrade to premium right from here. And, and I can see the price I'm going to pay for my account. And, but I don't have to go all the way to upgrade to the next plan. I can also, from the screen, I can go ahead and just add users to my existing account, existing plan. So on advanced, I can click on add users and I can easily um, choose a number of additional users I would like to add and that will add them to my account, to my advanced plan. And if I'm running out of storage, if I'm on the share file managed storage, not the and customer managed storage, if I'm on the share file managed storage in the cloud and I'm running out of storage, I can also come here and buy more storage. I can add uh, three terabyte storage packs, uh, as many of them as I need. I can select the number of uh, storage packs I would like to buy and, and it will indicate how much extra storage I'm going to have. And I can just click add and make the purchase from here. And um, when you go through this, uh, it might take up to 24 hours to update. So you can make your purchase and, and come back the next day and it should be updated um, within 24 hours. Typically it's much less, but we just always say it might take 24 hours just uh, in case it takes longer to go through all the billing system and the billing processes in our backend. Um, that's it from my side. Again, it's very quick. We have a few more minutes for Q&A. And, and if you have any more questions about the billing experience or any suggestion, and I'm happy to jump on a call with all of you. Sure. Thank yep. you very much. Jacob, we have, yeah, thank you so much, Jacob. We appreciate you and Bruno both joining us for today's webinar. We do have a decent amount of questions and little time to answer them. But I did want to go ahead and sum up a few questions, kind of push them all into one, Jacob. Uh, but we had a few people mention that they don't see uh, the billing section that you're seeing. They went there and only receipts and billing pops up. Um, just wondering what that looks like. And at some point, will they be able to see that same view that you have? And perhaps Bruno could help too, but. Yeah, great question. I can take this one. Um, sure. So for, for accounts that don't see exactly the view that I just showed, please reach out um, to our support team to take a look at this. Uh, there are certain scenarios that you might not see uh, the full billing section, depending how you purchased your share file account and, and how it was uh, processed. So please reach out to our team and, and look into your specific case. And then Jacob, can you mention how they can get in contact with you? Uh, one thing I do want to mention is after this webinar, you will have a survey pop up in your browser and there there'll be a button that says, may we contact you about this? 
And that's exactly, this is exactly the type of use case where we're happy to reach out and connect with you on these types of questions. But Jacob, if you have any other um, recommendations on contacting. Yeah, that'll be the best way. Um, or you can just uh, send out my email address, but this is more for um, suggestion enhancements to the product, not account specific sure. billing issues because those uh, are handled by our billing support team. They can look into your account, exactly what you paid, how much you paid, and when you paid, all the kind of details, if you have specific payment issue, and uh, that's our customer support team. They're the experts. They can give you all the answers there. And um, as a product manager, my goal is to look at the future of the product and see how we can improve it and make it better for all of you. And that's why I would love to learn um, what else we can do and get um, your thoughts. Sure. Thanks, Jacob. That was a great clarification for our customers out there. Uh, I do have a question for our good friend, Bruno. Uh, there was a question on subdomains. Um, can, can admins freely create the subdomains and is it three per account? Yes, and yes. Uh, so Perfect. <laughs> you are able to, to log in and generate a, an alias subdomain uh, whenever you want. They are similar to screen names. So bear in mind, you're looking for one that's available, right? <clears throat> um, and of course you wanna go with something that's easy to remember. Uh, I do want to emphasize too, uh, I think we also had another question that I answered in the Q&A that was kind of along these lines. Um, it doesn't send you anywhere different. They're all aliases, but they all point to the same destination. So for example, if you turn on SSO, that is not per subdomain, it's per your share file account, regardless of what the subdomain is, was, could be one day, doesn't matter. That's a share file thing. Subdomain does not play a role there. Um, but you are able to go in and as long as your subdomain that you want is available, you can set up a new one as a secondary. You can delete your original one if you really wanted to, so long as you've got a valid secondary already in place. So we know that you have a way to get there. Yep. Free and easy. Cool. Awesome. And then uh, bouncing off of that very quick, uh, when adding the subdomain, can you set up separate SSO under the subdomain? Right. So yeah, it's... It's just one SSO per share file account. Okay. Subdomain does not matter there. It makes no change. Okay. Great. And so we have a couple other questions here. Someone wanted to, I uh, had a question about, is there a way to check where we are signed in from to see any suspicious sign-ins? Yeah. Um, so are we curious about that? I did not see that one, but... Um, users can find my active sessions and my active connections in their own personal settings. But as part of user reports, which we did look at uh, towards the beginning when we were looking into reports, uh, excuse me, usage reports, um, we can actually see where the activity is coming from, both the IP address as well as the geographic location associated with that IP address. For instance, uh, and I, I won't show this on screen again, but um, one of our colleagues who was in that sample folder that I showed and produced the report on uh, lives one town over from me and worked one town over. So his um, his access was showing from a slightly different location than mine. Uh, that is available as part of your usage report. I would probably look there first and foremost. Perfect. And we have a question uh, bouncing off of reports. Can we manage who gets these reports if I want other users in my organization to be able to see uh, some of the reports? Not necessarily just uh, usage, but just on the report side. Because it sounds like it's saved in a folder, correct, Bruno? And people can have access to that folder. So that's, that's up to you how you want to do that. Um, sure. There is a user permission that determines whether or not any user can access reports, period. So that gives me the right to actually go in and run a report. That's one way of doing it. So if you want to give me free access to pull a messaging report, pull a share link report, pull a user report, any and all of those, that is associated with a permission for me as an individual. You've got to give me that right to use the reporting tool and make a report. However, if that's an overreach and you just want me to see one or two reports that 
you've set up or someone else, then you can choose to deposit those reports in a location to which I have access. Which if you think about it from a permission standpoint, it's kind of saying like, well, you ran a report and then you emailed it to me. Okay, I didn't run the report, you did, and then you shared it with me. It's the same thing without the email. Run the report and place it in a folder I can see, and now I can go and see it, right? But you didn't give me any more rights to do stuff on the account or dig into other users. Those are your two options and the two most commonly used ways of uh, leveraging reports across a team. Sure. And we, it looks like we probably have time for about one more question. Uh, I wanted to present this to you, Bruno, because I know you talked about your role as a customer success engineer and what you offer to your set of customers. But um, can you mention what customer success engineers are and perhaps how admins uh, can reach out to their customer success engineers? Sure, absolutely. A uh, uh, customer success engineer is, is going to be one of the admin's best friends. Um, we are available to you to help with training and deployment uh, and overall ensure the success of your account. I do want to clarify because this is frequently confused and for good reason. Uh, we are not necessarily tech support. It's not the exact same thing, but we are here as a resource to help you when you do have technical issues, because sometimes something's not broken. It's a matter of not understanding how to use it properly. That's why so many of us are assisting with these webinars. Um, so we're here for your, your training and to make sure you're skilled up and able to use ShareFile to the fullest and the most effective manner and get what you need without feeling like something is broken or there's a problem that needs to be fixed. Uh, and a lot of times with the proper training and resources, we can sidestep a lot of those that might have come up to begin with. Um, but every account has a dedicated customer success engineer who is here for you to answer some questions via email, book a meeting, take a look at your account if needed. Uh, and if you do have truly um, strange technical requests, which, hey, this is the tech world that can happen. Sometimes things break and you do need to actually open a support ticket. Your customer success engineer can help you become acquainted with that process. And even if absolutely necessary uh, assist you with any escalations there so again we want to be the admin's best friend reach out to us let's see what we can do for you absolutely fantastic bruno and just to mention folks um, if you are an admin you will see uh, within share file if you're using the client version of it you'll notice there in the bottom right uh, that little share file logo that has resources there there is a link inside of there to contact your success engineer. So if you don't know who yours is or you want to reach out to them, set up time with them, you do have that option there within ShareFile. Um, and even below that, if it is an urgent need, there is a link to contact support there as well. And I, I love what you said, Bruno, that customer success engineers should be your best friend. I know the customer success engineer team is my best friend and Allison's best friend. So glad we can be best friends to our customers too. With that being said, Thank you, Bruno. Thank you, Jacob, for all your time. And thank you to the team that joined us here today and shared a little bit of your time. So we appreciate all of you and we hope to see you at the next webinar. Our team will stay on just for a quick little bit to answer any open questions that are in the Q&A panel. Uh, we'll be typing those out, won't be answering those live. And have a great rest of your Tuesday, everyone. We'll see you soon. Cheers. Bye.